Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to London Tech Week Connects, and now our focus on venture capital. Um, we uh, have a all-star cast, as you'd expect. Um, also, for those that don't know you, know me, I'm Brent Hoberman, Executive Chairman of Founders Forum, which is delighted to be a major partner of London Tech Week Connects. Um, but now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the guru of technology. Um, the godfather of European technology, um, Rory Kellen Jones, who I've known for a very long time, ever since he um, once included me in his book, which he reminded me was um, doggedly called Dot Bomb. Um, but things went up from there, um, and uh, he can he can guide us now through um, the future. So thank you, Rory, for doing this. Thank you, Brent. Uh, yeah, it's been. Onwards and upwards for Brent ever since the days of Dot Bomb. <laughs> Being included in a book by me was obviously the big thing for him. We've got a fabulous panel here. Um, I'm looking out at the, um, the thousands of you virtually out there. I'm actually looking out on my garden, but um, uh, we've got uh, the stars of venture capital from uh, around the world. So we've got Mika Salmi, managing partner of Lakestar, a serial entrepreneur uh, whose work life, uh, life has been primarily centered on discovering talent and driving new ideas. And Mika is in speaking to us from Zurich. Uh, Alexis de Ratz and James, founder and managing partner of uh, Marion Ventures, uh, US and UK venture capital firm, uh, funding female founders and co-founders in a whole range of new technologies. Uh, Alexis is in the Napa Valley. It's looking great there. Uh, Ichaso del Palacio, partner at Notion, uh, leading European uh, Focus VC, uh, invested in companies such as GoCardless, Currency Crowd, TradeShift, Onfido, and Unbabel, amongst others. And last but not least, uh, oh, by the way, Ichasio is also in London, but she tells me she's in Shoreditch, which is a lot trendier than where I am in West London. Uh, uh, and last but not least, Abdul Gafour, uh, Managing Director EMEA for Intel Capital. Uh, he's uh, leading Intel's uh, capital's investment activities across Western Europe. Uh, he's based in London, but he's in lovely Sirencester in Gloucestershire. So thank you, all of you. Um, I'm going to get underway um, by imagining something amazing. Imagine none of this had happened. Uh, and we're in, the, we're in the middle of 2020. Um, we're sailing on. Nothing's happened. Uh, what I want to know from each of you is what, where would you have been investing if this hadn't happened? And now that this has happened, where are you investing now? What, what's changed? Uh, Alexis, can you get, under, get, get us underway? Sure. Um, it's, I think it's a really good question and a really important question. For us, um, very little has changed. We've always focused on female founders and co-founders with a really wide diversity lens. Right now, I'd have to say what we're seeing and what has really captured our interest are wearables and wearables that allow you to manage your health today and in the future, because we just don't think that's going to change. Um, you know, we will roll on, we will get out of this, but I think the memory of people of what this experience was will remain very, very strong. So we're looking at really all the interfaces for um, private health, public health, wearable health, using AI and machine learning and consumer facing technologies. Uh, Abdul, what about you? Uh, you presumably have been on a plane a lot by now. Um, <laughs> uh, what kind of companies would you have been looking at and, and has that changed? Firstly, welcome everyone. Um, actually, I don't think it's changed very much. We always, uh, Intel Capital is mainly an investor in, in business to business and enterprise type deeper deep technologies that are generally hidden from consumers. So a lot of the things that we invest in are not well known or understood outside of the technology business. And our focus had been quite a lot on things around data center and connectivity. And luckily those things have been um, positively, positively impacted by the crisis in many ways. So we, we have continued investing on that path. Um, so we haven't changed very much. I mean, of course, we will make some detailed changes, but in terms of the big sectors, which are always around connecting people, connecting uh, devices at the edge of the network, and then how do you run data centers more efficiently and uh, more cost effectively? I think those big trends haven't changed for us. So the fact that we're all massively using this web infrastructure has been 
good for your your the, the kind of companies you look at. It has. I mean, it's a terrible, uh, terrible crisis pandemic that we're going through. And I wouldn't wish it on anyone, but actually, it has. What it has shown is how dependent we've all become on technology. And the other thing it's shown is some of the vulnerabilities that uh, people who are providing services have had. So an interesting byproduct, which I certainly wouldn't have um, predicted when lockdown started, was the amount of uh, acquisition activity that we have seen. And I, I'd be interested in some of the other panelists' views as well. So um, last week, we sold a company in Israel called Spot to NetApp. And that was all about optimizing uh, data center uh, usage and resources. Um, I was involved in an exit in a Russian uh, telecoms company last week, which closed. And I wouldn't have expected to be selling anything in this environment for months, uh, perhaps the whole year. But interestingly, what, for example, NetApp found was that um, it needed to understand some of the vulnerabilities on how people are using data centers. And this was an ideal acquisition to fill a hole in the meantime. So interestingly, whilst we're always focused on investments, acquisitions have actually, for me anyway, have, have taken a, a front and leading role in the last few weeks. Echesso, tell me that things have changed for you, because um, I, 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 I need a story here. Yeah, so um, um, in fact, you know what, um, I'm going to, to help you on this to build a story. Um, I do agree with the rest of the panelists in certain way that our investment focus hasn't changed, but I think it will be unfair for our founders to say that things haven't changed. Because to be very honest, they've gone through such a struggle, many of them, with their customers and to be able to retain their talent and to, uh, and to go through specifically the initial couple of weeks, rebudgeting and cutting uh, uh, on the people and, and extending the runway and, and things like that. So I think it will be very unfair for the entrepreneurs who are listening to us to tell that we haven't changed. We have really been focused on helping our portfolio companies. We really are trying to, um, uh, to help, specifically in the first couple of weeks, extending that runway. And after that, thinking of how do you approach and how do you communicate to your, with your customers so that you don't lose your customers and you can, in fact, build the pipeline for the time they come back, you can ramp up again the revenues. So I think I would say there has been a shift on the time and on the focus of our, of our um, basically commitment with our portfolio, definitely. And obviously, you, like everybody else, has not been traveling uh, what what have you what what's been the pattern of your 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 life as a as a, as a as a VC that, yeah, that is think. different? Is, has it been more efficient, less efficient? Are you are you talking to more people, fewer people? I, I would love to hear from the rest of the panelists, but I think there is this trend of uh, basically from, from your office, which is. Uh, uh, five, 10 meters away from your bedroom and, uh, and from the kitchen, which is other 10 meters away. And, and you end up having those Zoom calls back to back, back to back the whole day. Yes. And I, I don't know, some people are talking about, and I would love to hear from the rest of the panelists who are, are talking about becoming much more efficient. But to be very honest, I feel that in online conversations, um, you don't get to the to the to, to the bottom of many points that you need to uh, do a couple of calls with entrepreneurs to get into, which means that in the end that efficiency of the timing of not moving um, and and so on is not really efficient. So I don't know. I would love to hear from the rest of the people, but I feel my lockdown is is a Zoom uh, lockdown. <laughs> Yeah, mine too. I have three Zoom meetings before 10.30 with colleagues at the office. And I used to be the guy that never went to meetings. I'm not sure it's an improvement. Uh, Mika, what about you? Um, how's life changed for you? What, uh, where would you have been investing if none of this had happened? Uh, so and I used to, has, it, has, has anything changed? So I think I can help your story also uh, a little bit. Uh, so we are at Lakestar on our third and fourth funds. Uh, so we have a 250 million euro early stage fund and a 400 million euro growth fund. And so from all those funds, including our first and second funds, there's about 90 companies. And so we spent the first few weeks 
triaging those companies and seeing which ones are uh, going to need cash or which ones have to do the biggest kind of changes to their business plan. Uh, so that was a big part of the first few weeks for us. And uh, uh, for better or worse, I actually lived through the 2001 and 2008 crisis as an entrepreneur. In the, in the, the 2008 one, I spoke at the uh, Sequoia RIP Good Times presentation. Sequoia was one of my investors. And so I actually gave a presentation on uh, on how to downsize, and so I was part of the, the the presentation there. So I became the kind of internal expert on uh, on, on how do you uh, look at cost cutting and, and restructuring, and how do you actually look at your balance sheet and your and your kind of uh, business plan looking forward. So I was very very busy in the beginning doing that. Uh, we also had quite a few deals that were in the process, and so we continued on those investments without any change. And so we closed, I think, about five investments within the first month uh, that were in process. Uh, but the big thing that I would say the change for us was that, you know, we had this growth fund. We have not been active on the growth side as much. And we've been looking more at seed investments. And we've done a few seed deals, partly because we feel that um, companies that are being formed now or are young now are, are going to be much more uh, adaptable and ready for this new environment going forward. And so we're excited about looking at more seed deals, which historically Lakestar hasn't done a lot of seed deals, but we've been actually quite active in the seed space uh, during this uh, lockdown period. And you bring us neatly on to our sort of next subject, which is valuations. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to you first on that, Nika. Has, ha, has the pandemic, uh, I mean, one, one would immediately assume that A, a lot of investment activity would stop and, and B, valuations would come right down. But uh, on the public markets, of course, we've seen that extraordinary descent and then recovery. What what's been happening in in the in the venture world in terms of valuations? For us, um, we had a few of our portfolio companies that were uh, raising money, and we definitely saw some pressure on them uh, on the valuation side. Uh, for our current companies, companies we were pursuing, um, I think the conversation was much was pretty direct about like, is this environment going to affect your business plan? If it's going to affect your business plan, it's going to affect your valuation. So if if, if the revenue is going to be down this year from that, that, that should affect your valuation. But I can't say across the board there's been a real strong dip in valuations. Um, and it's, it's, it's a, you know, I would say for me, actually, it's a little perplexing because I, I look at the stock market being up and I keep thinking it should go down because in the, the past two uh, downturns, it, it clearly went down. And so the, the, the shoe may drop here in the fall or early next year uh, more, but I, I haven't seen a big drop, which I've been expecting. Uh, Abdul, what about yeah. you? I mean, we are seeing, uh, I mean, the OECD has got a, a most, the, the, the most frightening economic forecast you've, you've ever seen out today. We're yeah. seeing the, the you know predictions of the worst economic downturn that we've seen in our, our lifetimes, really. Um, surely it's having an effect on valuations. Surely, you know, uh, people that were expecting to have new rounds as well were have not been getting them. Yes, um, I agree. Two things I would point out. One is the, the absolute level of the valuation. And secondly, is the amount of money being raised. So on the valuation itself, it takes time. There is a there is a time lag between uh, people understanding that the situation has changed and them being willing, the entrepreneurs being willing to accept changed terms. And it it, it may be things other than the valuation. It may be other terms, uh, economic terms that you're talking about. But the valuation is the easy one to focus on. So that has taken a little bit of time. I think four to six weeks at least for people to internalize those changes. And we we are generally looking where they're relevant. Um, sort of 20 to 30%, I think, changes in valuation compared with pre-crisis. But there are other cases where actually people are able to demand higher valuations because they just happen to be in hotter sectors like gaming and e-commerce, which is not areas we play very actively, but I've certainly seen that as well. But the other point is around about the round size. So one of the conversations that you have to have is, as a result of the new circumstances we find ourselves in, are you raising enough money? You know, we would like to see companies, whether they're existing portfolio companies or new companies, having at least 18 to 24 months of, ca of capital in this scenario. Mm -hmm. um, so it was often the case that companies were coming to us raising for, you know, nine to 12 months on the basis that the markets would remain open and they'd be able to go back to the market again. And given all of this uncertainty, I think we're asking people to have a slightly higher bank balances than they would have done in the past. Uh, Alexis, coming to you, I mean, uh... You look at the Nasdaq hitting an all-time high yesterday. President Trump told me all about that this morning. Um, 
uh, portfolio companies might be coming and saying, hey, it, the, the crisis is over. Um, valuations must be going to take off again. It must be a great climate for a new round. What, what, what are you telling your companies? Well, like Abdul and Mika, it really um, look, depends on your portfolios and when they're raising rounds. And our portfolios, we're not currently raising rounds. And so we don't really have a marker for you know what the discount would be. What we're assuming and what we're modeling is that across the board, probably within two to three months, we'll start to see a 30% discount for those companies that do need to raise funds. They've been holding off. They've received from PPP support or other support from the government. So we're assuming across the board for venture about a 30% discount, but because our focus is very much female founders and co-founders, what we tend to see is that women suffer a deeper discount than men. And so I would actually model 30 to 40% for female founders. It's just because that, it's- That's hard. extraordinary. There, it, there's facts showing that. It is, but it's harder up front to raise money. Uh, women raise smaller rounds. Um, they're at a discount when they start. And I, you know, I just think we have to be very honest and be extremely helpful to our founders getting access to capital, which is scarce. But, you know, the discounts we're modeling are about 30 percent, you know, largely due to a lot of the things you just pointed out is that no one has really factored in the full consequences because we didn't know how to measure this. Once, you know, now that we're getting a, um, a handle on how to measure the consequences, I think we'll see the discounts in two to three months. Yeah. Yeah. Um Echesso, uh, what are you telling your 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 companies about valuations? I think, um, well, I will agree with uh, the points that we made, but I think um, one of the things I'm really uh, looking at, and um, and I like to see not only from our portfolio companies, but also from the companies which come to raise from us, is a, a plan that they've put together as a response uh, to this situation. And in some cases, as Abdul said, it might be an extended runway. In other cases, it might be reducing, if, if, if the companies are still building the product, maybe it is a reducing the amount raised to reduce the risk too. So it depends and, and playing a little bit um, on that, have, positioning yourself. I'm not saying which one is best. Each company needs to look at, a, a, at their position, but I think it's important that the companies adjust their plans to that. That gives us a good understanding on their capacity to, to react to potential threats in the market. And, and, and having a good understanding of that is important. I think um, the 30% that Alexis is talking about, regardless on women or, or uh, gender um, attached or not, our portfolio is, is um, uh, male dominated as, as many other ones, but we invest in B2B SaaS, which I, I'm seeing more and more women coming through the door, which um, I'm very optimistic about it and uh, doing much more deep tech and, and B2B enterprise and SaaS um, staff. But um, I would say in general, there is, if those companies don't grow at the speed that they were growing before, then obviously the valuation that they are going to be, get is going to be determined by the revenue and the growth rates at that point. So that means if they cannot grow through this time as they were raising before, then we will see that ratio of the 30% or 20% or whatever. So I think that is something that is going to happen. But um, I think investors, we are going to open to see companies um, that have a slowdown in growth and it will not be a, a, a red flag for us not to invest in the companies when we've seen that maybe in Q1, Q2 has a slowdown because of that. And, and we will we will see that in the in the next year still. We will still see companies uh, in that space, right? Now you must all have companies in your portfolio. I mean, everyone's got companies that, that at some stage you decide are not going to make it. Um, that's the nature of the business. Uh, has this accelerated that process, Mika? Are people falling off the end of the, the plank, as it were? Well, during this kind of a triage period, we, we identified about a handful of companies that we thought were in trouble that had less than 12 months of cash, some had less than six months of cash. And uh, we worked very hard with them to make sure that they extended their runway at least till next spring, if farther. And so we actually, <laughs> to be honest, like, to your point, we thought that maybe one of these two won't make it. 
Um, but they've all looking, they're all looking good. So we're, we are very pleasantly surprised at the resiliency of our portfolio at this point. So I, I have to say that we, we are expecting the worst and we haven't seen it. Um, not to say it won't happen later, but it, it has not. And, and so far we're, we're stable. And actually we've got quite a few companies that are actually accelerating this, in this environment. So that's been nice. We also have a bunch of travel companies that are, that are suffering, but they're also recovering quicker than we thought. So, um, in general, we're, we're in good shape. And I didn't think that uh, two months ago. What's interesting is, of course, this brings us on to uh, another topic, sort of government support. Uh, and there was uh, a debate here in the UK when there was talk of creating a fund uh, for startups, which was eventually created, the Future Fund, about whether actually governments would be keeping alive companies that would have died anyway. Um, Alexis, what, what have you, you thought about government support? Uh, uh, various schemes that we've seen around the world. Yeah, I think absolutely essential. And of course, um, you know, everyone who has um, seed companies, seed or C plus or young companies that are seed and A rounds, they were particularly hit. And so the programs in the States like the PPP program, and I would think the majority, yes, the majority of our portfolios did access those programs were vital because it's helped stabilize salaries, rent and mortgage. And, it was a really necessary um, influx of of money. And the same is true for the UK. I'm just so happy that they had a very specific fund targeted for venture because the government um, and society needs these young companies. And so I'm really happy they stepped up. Um, I think in the beginning it was a little complicated because not everyone knew how the policies worked and how to apply online, but really it sorted itself out within seven to 10 days. And the money flowed through to the companies, all of our portfolio companies that applied did get it. So I'm, I'm very happy and I think it's a necessary, absolutely necessary measure by governments. Abdul, what do you say to the argument that um, the government is effectively providing uh, a cushion that that is not needed? Um, yeah. That, you know, a, as we all know, a whole bunch of uh, companies in, in, the, in this area uh, fail anyway. Um, let let them fail and let um, let uh, government money go to you know workers in need. Yeah, but but not to you know taking bets, frankly, uh, on uh, on companies when that's the the ventures venture capitals uh, industries uh, yep. uh, thing. Mm. Uh, this is a very finely balanced argument, and unlike many of our co-investors. And I'm not saying that we were right or they were wrong, but we looked very hard and fast. In fact, we were quite slow or, or we expressed caution for on behalf of our portfolio companies when it came to applying for many of these schemes. So for example, the PPP scheme that Alex, Alexis referred to in the US, there are some um, quite serious penalties if you, um, if you make some errors in the application. So for example, you have to, you have to be able to, to state that there were no alternative um, funds available. So for example, that your existing shareholders were not willing to fund you further, or you couldn't get bank loans, for example, or venture venture debt and, and all kinds of other financing. And so you had to be sort of the PPP had to be the last resort. And that often was not the case. So you have to be very careful when you self-certified these kinds of things. So we did express caution. Uh, everybody dived into the PPP scheme in the US because some of our portfolio companies, even in Europe, have, U have US subsidiaries. Um, similar thing when it came to the furlough schemes and in, in companies that I know in France and the UK. But the, the future fund, interestingly, has been a lot more finely balanced. I think the government, the UK government has struck a bit more of a balance between risk and reward because the terms are not overly generous to the uh, startup companies. You know, the, the, com the government gets a deep discount. They're always going to be the most senior class of shares. And so our, our companies have been much more circumspect, at least the ones I've spoken with, when they apply for that kind of assistance. But I agree also with Alexis that these should be the uh, the future stars of our economy, and um, to snuff them out at an early stage would be um, a false economy. Okay, let's move on to the topic of diversity and inclusion, and whether actually this extraordinary year um, might create opportunities to to, to change that. Um, Mika, any 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 thoughts on that? Any any thoughts on whether you know people who, who you wouldn't have seen maybe five years ago? Um, if the process of you know getting more people into the a into the venture capital industry and getting different kinds of founders funded, is that going to change because of this? 
I think it's a much needed conversation and I've been fortunate in most of my my companies or places I've worked, uh, they've been uh, fairly diverse uh, businesses uh, and you know, the venture capital uh, industry as Ishtasho said is, that is not so diverse and I think that's a, it's a much needed kind of conversation. I think the challenge is that uh, a lot of people are paying at lip service saying, yeah, we're, we, we believe in diversity and, and they make all these statements, but to really be diverse, you have to actually be proactive and, and, uh, and, um, and, and do it on a, on a purposeful level. So you have to actually say, we're actually going to do this. You have to set goals and actually make it happen. I think that is a, a bit of a challenge for a lot, of, a lot of firms to do because I think it's, it's, it, it takes effort. It's not, it's not about just sitting back and hoping the best candidates come to you and say, okay, now we'll, we'll choose one that's going to be a diverse candidate. You have to go look for these people if you really believe in this. Completely. And does this kind of crisis actually provide an, an opportunity to do that in a way? Um, it does. It, 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 it just puts a, a lens on it that you say, look, this, this is what needs to happen. And it makes everyone think about it in a much different way as opposed to just saying, yeah, for years, you know, it's been discussed, but nothing, there hasn't been much action. I think there's going to be some action now. Echesso, yeah. what's, your, what's your take on this? Uh, were you seeing change already and will this accelerate it? I, I've seen a change already, definitely. I would say, uh, I will use an example of um, a notion um, our firm has started a program last year uh, on um, inclusion and, um, from the VC side. So it's called Included That VC. And we basically put together uh, a syndicate of um, eight 10 venture capitalists uh, with the support with a couple of a couple of, um, of uh, corporates supporting the program, and we are giving education to around 60 fellows per year uh, on venture capital. And we do believe that we, if we increase the diversity within the venture capital community, we will also increase the diversity of the founders coming to, to raise money and we will be able to, to target some communities that otherwise maybe we don't have access with because usually um, myself, I, I, I get surrounded by people who are in my community and, 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 and I have access to those, right? So if we make that venture capital community much more diverse, so last year, we, we basically started the program, which in fact is um, last weekend. We had the last um, final weekend, which was going to be in Madrid for the 60 fellows around Europe uh, to get together. And it's an incredibly diverse. You can't even imagine uh, how, how, how diverse is the group. And we did it online. Uh, we are about to launch the second one in two weeks. And we are definitely proactively uh, supporting that. If you look at uh, uh, probably today, uh, our uh, we have an analyst uh, who is uh, uh, black, and he has uh, posted a very interesting blog post uh, that we are uh, pushing through Notion, and we are positioning ourselves. And we have a diverse team right now. We are looking actively to increase the number of, of investors, even within the team. Uh, starting from ourselves, right, uh, in terms of diversity. And I think it's super important to be able to, in fact, get to those opportunities which target what are called minorities, which are not minorities, mm. but, but are a big opportunity and a big population in the market. But uh, we are definitely making a bet on that. Alexis, I've got a question which I think, uh, which has come in from uh, the audience from Claudia Ruiz Graham. Uh, why do women get lower valuations? What would you recommend to us to be on equal footing to male founders? That's obviously a female founder looking for advice. Yeah, and I think it's a good question. And historically, we know that there are, you know, there are um, biases in how we view women innovators. Um, when you just step back and think of you know, the majority of college graduates are women, and yet they still receive less than 5% of venture funding. So there's an enormous disconnect there, but it's also an enormous opportunity. My personal view, and I think the view of all of my colleagues is, we've been doing this since 2015, and we see very little difference in the kind of innovation and technologies that women and men create and want to have funded, but the market just doesn't fund them because there are really no metrics or parameters or guidelines um, that hold them to task. And so I think if we want to get valuations up, um, 
COVID is an excellent opportunity for us to really rethink how we invest in women and minorities. We have data from five years that shows it's an, an enormous alpha in the market or an ability to outperform. If we're educating 50% of the population, they're getting uh, and undergraduate degrees and advanced degrees, and we're not investing in them, all of society is penalized because we're not investing in all of the innovation and technology that's available to us. So I think if we could get investors, and my definition of investors for this particular answer is philanthropists, um, endowments, pension funds, if they put guidelines into venture funds and private equity funds that said, we want greater transparency and we want a greater flow of funds into women and minorities, it would happen, but there have to be metrics that are really adopted at an industry level for the valuations to equalize and for the opportunities to be really equally deployed across industry. And I cannot think of a better time now. I mean, now is the very best time um, given COVID and the challenges we have. We have to invest in everyone to find a cure and we have to really just optimize a hugely inefficient um, funding cycle that we have. And I think that's it's going to have to require some really serious rethink about how we measure flow of funds going into venture funds and private equity. Some accountability for sure. Abdul, I want to talk about yeah. geographical diversity. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's been a cliche for you know the last 25 years that we're seeing the death of distance. And yet, uh, venture, you know, if you're in the valley, um, if you can step outside and see someone, they're more likely to get funded than someone, I don't know, in the Midwest or uh, in some other far-flung part of the world. Now that this is how we're all communicating, um, is there going to be more geographical diversity and that in turn leading to diversity in, in other ways? If I may, I'd like to just amplify some of the comments on diversity that uh, Ichasu, Alexis, and, and Mika made. But, and I will answer your question, Rory, about geographical diversity. First of all, I'm, I'm enormously proud of the advances that have been made in the industry since I've been involved. And I, I joined Intel Capital nearly 20 years ago uh, when we were one of the early investors in Brent's company, actually, um, lastminute.com. But um, last year, well, two, two points I would make. One is the one that Alexis made, which is around the limited partners, the people who invest in venture funds. They can drive this agenda. If they enforce that they will only invest in funds that meet a certain diversity criteria, I think that will drive change amongst the general partners, the venture capital partners uh, of the likes that we see on the panel. Um, and secondly, which, that which you measure, you change. So for example, about four or five years ago, Intel Corporation as part of its diversity challenges started measuring um, the makeup and, and the wage uh, wages and salaries of various underrepresented minorities at Intel. We extended that into Intel Capital. So we measure uh, every single company that we log, we record whether they, you know, if they fit into any of the various categories of underrepresented minorities, whether it's gender, sexuality, disability, um, so, um, veterans, service, uh, military service people. Um, and, and, and so forth. And um, last year, we invested uh, on, on our figures for 2019, 19 companies that we invested in fitted those criteria, which was $122 million. And approximately one sixth of our portfolio of around about 300 companies in total, so about I think 47, 48 companies, uh, fit into that diverse category. And, and, I'm, and, that, and those figures would have been probably a quarter of that, of that number in terms of the adults invested uh, just three years ago. So last year, a quarter of the total money that Intel invested was in companies that would fit the diverse uh, criteria, which is, I think is, a, is an enormous uh, change. In terms of geographical diversity, I think you have to have knowledge about the markets in which you invest. So I think it's still unlikely that um, a very smart partner who's based in California is going to feel comfortable or should be doing deals in Taiwan or China remotely, because you have to know about local culture, local laws, local regulations, how how local founders work. What um, about in Idaho? <laughs> well, th th that, that's equally true, I think. And, and yeah. we do see regional venture firms in the US as well that are able to build a franchise for themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think whilst you can do things remotely, I think you still need to have that local knowledge. And that's very difficult to come by unless you've lived and breathed the local cultures. I want to bring this all together. Uh, and finish off by talking about founders, um, 
we've had a, a, a question in about what would be the one piece of advice you would give to founders, what are the opportunities? But I also want to talk about mental health. I mean, this, we all know, has been a really difficult time in all sorts of ways for all sorts of people. Uh, being a founder is a really stressful occupation, exciting but stressful. Um, Alexis, coming to you first, um, what, what have you... Uh, what have you seen in terms of uh, founders and, and mental health and what's the one piece of advice you might like to hand over? Yeah, and I think it's a really important um, point to close on is that founders and funders have been stressed um, in ways that we never thought imaginable. But I think founders, young founders and the founders we focus on, which are seed, C plus and A, are particularly vulnerable because they're very often females and female founders or co-founders and they're young and they're experienced, they need as much support as possible. And that's not financial support, that's just guidance um, that they can call you for small things. I mean, sometimes founders just get really paralyzed on the small things. Like, I'm so afraid of making a decision because I may make a mistake. You have to kind of slow things down and say, you know, that's normal, that's that's rational. Everyone's trying to slow things down and you do need to move forward. And um, I'm really proud of all the things you've done. So a lot of reinforcement, a lot of engagement, a lot of telephone calls, and a lot of support that says, you know what, you should be afraid. Uh, this is a really tough time. Um, call me, call me anytime you need to talk. And I have found the founders doing that without question. I think it's made the last three months much easier for many people. Um, we are all linked by one thing. We've been humbled universally and globally by um, you know, financial and health situations that, that no one really has an answer to. So I think being available to founders is what we've done um, more so than in any other time that I've been in the business and I've been in the business 17 years. So that shouldn't stop, that's gonna continue. And I think the emergence of mental health apps is something I welcome enormously. So I see um, enormous amount of those, uh, we review them and I think it's, it's really um, important, whatever you need, whether it's a CBT, cognitive behavioral app, um, an app that connects friends or mothers or founders, anything that um, is really shared in a network has got to be positive and additive to what we're doing now. But accessibility and being very accessible to your founders is essential. Mika, what about you? What are you, what are you saying to your founders at the moment? I think, first of all, I want to tell them that they're not alone. So that the, the, the feelings they're having are not uh, uh, unique to them, that they, they should be able to reach out. I think the most important thing, though, I think for a founder, especially a CEO founder, is that they need to have someone they can talk to. So it's very difficult if you are a CEO to talk to your executive team about how you're feeling about things. It's hard to talk to your investors, even to your, your, your spouse or people at home. It's hard to talk to them. So it's important to have a mentor, independent board director. Maybe it's a, a, an avenue to talk to another founder. Uh, who's in the same situation, I, I really feel it's important for them to feel that they know that they, they have someone they can have an outlet to talk to about how they're feeling about things because I think uh, it's, a, it's, it's a delicate situation they're in. So I, I do think that's a very important. Abdul, how well are you placed in your fine looking home in Sarancester <laughs> to, to give that kind of support? I mean, that's one of the problems. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're all suffering Zoom fatigue. Mm -hmm. I am. Um, can you really give that kind of support? I and mean, what, what are you telling these people? I mean, I hold my hands up. I've never been a founder. I've worked for some smaller companies, some larger companies, um, but I've never been in the same position. So I don't pretend to know exactly what they're going through. What I can do, though, is share knowledge and experience that I've picked up. And the other thing that I would say that, that we do, so it's a shoulder to cry on to some extent and talk things through, which I, I think founders find useful. The other thing that I found of great benefit in these times where meeting in person has been very difficult is putting putting founders in contact with other founders in other companies that we know who are, who are going through the same thing at the same time. So when it comes to laying off um, a small proportion or a large proportion of your workforce, that's something I can't claim to have any experience on. I mean, I've done it to one or two individuals that have worked for me, unfortunately, in the past, but I haven't done it sort of large scale layoffs. But there are other executives in our portfolios that have done that. So one of the things that we have done is matchmake and say, you know, go and talk to Fred or talk to, to, to Jane who has done this before and, um, and they can empathize with one another and learn some useful tips. So and that's one thing that certainly helps. On a mass Zoom call, I hope. 
No, more one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you know, we say this portfolio company over here could certainly use the experience of this other portfolio CEO over there. So it's it's more matchmaking one-on-one -on -one, rather than a, a big Zoom call. Echesso, uh what about you? What, what are you saying to your founders? And let me back to this one sort of a, one piece of advice. Yeah, in our case, in fact, it has been more of a group thing. We organized from the very beginning. <laughs> Um, every week, uh, a founders called. Uh, uh, the first week was twice a week um, in the evening after work uh, for the founders to get together, and now it has gone to one uh, time a week. And the conversation has shifted a lot from the measurements putting in place and, and sharing their their best practices. To to a cat in headcount or or extend the runway to look at how do we make an opportunity out of it and and right now the conversations have really shifted uh, so in some of them we've been involved internally at Notion and uh, and it has been great to see that shift because you see the companies are kind of standing up and coming up through it and, and and yes they went through very tough time but now they are looking at okay how can we make an opportunity out of this and this is fantastic to see from the company so i'm i'm super proud of our founders and uh and and very supportive at the same time well we've run out of time thank you very much uh, alexis Echasso, abdul and mika and i hope you've all enjoyed listening i've certainly found it uh, a really stimulating 40 minutes uh, one of my better Zooms, I think, of uh, the last uh, 10 or 11 weeks. So thank you very much to the panel. And back to Brent. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks to the, all the panel. Um, that was great. Well and tour. Thank you, Rory, for leading it as ever. Um, and now we have a short networking break. Um, so please do um, go and meet some exciting people um, on the app. Um, and then afterwards, we will be hearing from Lord Grimstone, who is the Minister of Investment. Um, and he will be talking about how the pandemic has affected the UK market, and he will be in conversation afterwards with Janet Coyle from London Apartments. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>